Mexican paleontology deserves more attention. Though there seems to be a rarity of complete and diverse fossil material from the region, this is an illusion created by many things, including the economic disparity between Mexico and the US. Plenty of parachute science has drip-fed interesting single-digit finds for over a hundred years, but a ton of work by local paleontologists has built up the field to the powerhouse it is today. One of the more standout Mexican fossils published by Americans was a large and very mysterious theropod dinosaur, which has changed faces over the years. This piece deserves a more in-depth look than it is often given. The tyrannosaurs were a very important group of large, robust, fleet-footed, hyper-predatory theropod dinosaurs that successfully produced many forms from the early to late Cretaceous in Europe, Asia, and North America. The evolution of the later tyrannosaurs is the most well understood, though it is still constantly in flux thanks to a constant flow of new members. The early evolution of this group is moderately understood, with small generalized forms that stretch the group into the late Jurassic and possibly into South America. There seems to be a rather shrouded gap in Tyrannosaur evolution between the end of the early Cretaceous and the beginning of the late Cretaceous. A spread of time one could informally nickname the Mid-Cretaceous. There are only a handful or less of tyrannosauroids known from this period of time, and they're all mostly super fragmentary, and it's been difficult for experts to tell exactly where they may place in an evolutionary context, with many often receiving various identifications over the years. Jinbeisaurus is three skull pieces, a few vertebrae, and a chunk of pelvis from the Chinese Huichangbu formation of anywhere from 99 to 71 million years ago. Moros is a leg and some teeth from the Utahan Lower Mustn't-Touch-It member of the Upper Cedar Mountain Formation of about 96.4 million years ago. Susky Tyrannus is a standout here in being two specimens of various skull and postcranial bones from the New Mexican Moreno Hill Formation of 92 million years ago. Dimmerlangia is a few skull pieces, about one vertebra from each major section of the spinal column, and some claws from the Uzbek Bisekti formation of 92 to 19 million years ago. That's about the entirety of the Tyrannosauroid fossil record from this chunk of time. As you can see, it's not very good, and doesn't really tell you how big things were getting and how quickly. Most of these animals were rather small, at around the size of a small deer, to medium-sized at 4 meters. There are also a few more possible tyrannosaurs from this time that I left out, but their dates are shaky and their fossils even shakier, so I figured it best not to include them. These smaller, early tyrannosaurs contain traits that align with the development of hallmark tyrannosaur traits with Timmerlangia especially proving that these animals were developing hypersenses and bigger skulls first before evolving into the robust bodies of the later forms. However, a monkey wrench has been floating around the annals of Tyrannosaur literature since the mid-1970s, though, like these early forms, it too is very fragmentary and anomalous. Once field season rolled around, in the summer of 1970, Dr. William J. Morris, an expert in West Coast Mesozoic Paleontology, led a joint expedition between the LA County Museum of Natural History and the National Geographic Society to a few sites in Baja, California. The crew was prospecting and excavating fossils outside of the town of El Rosario, in an area south of Arroyo del Rosario and north of Baja Punta, when then-volunteer Harley James Garbani was looking through a late Cretaceous-aged outcrop and discovered a handful of dinosaur bones eroding out of a two-square-meter area near the top of the side of a hill. One of the many ways paleontologists find more substantial specimens is to follow trails of small bits of bones from a low elevation area to a higher one, like from a gully to the top of a hill. The little eroded bits of bone at the bottom are usually always eroding out of an outcrop of rock from a higher point. 
Garbani and any other workers he wrangled to help him, excavated the fossils, field prepared them, and hauled them back to their trucks and trailers as just one part of the major expedition season. They wouldn't see the light of day for a few more years. A year after these dinosaur fossils were uncovered from Baja California, another excavation crew revisited the site to search for more possible remains of the same animal that ultimately came up short. All there was to this animal had been collected by the first field crew. Once the specimens were safely placed within the collections of the LA Museum, fossil preparators likely cleaned some of these bones, and they would be formally published in 1974 by Ralph Molnar in the Journal of Paleontology. So let's take a gander at what Garbani found. All told, the specimen described by Molnar, specimen LECM20877, included a chunk of bone from the back of the skull called a quadrate, the entirety of a bone from the top and side of the skull called a frontal, the bottom tooth-carrying part of the upper jaw, which is called the maxilla, a small chunk of the lower jaw or dentary, both halves of the back part of the hip bone that sticks out backwards, called the ischia, a central portion of the hip bone that points forward, called the pubis, a tail rib, a bit of foot bone called a metatarsal, a toe bone, and some teeth. An honest to god horrible specimen. But hey, if it preserves enough traits to separate it from other dinosaurs, then by all means, give it a name and do a whole evolutionary analysis on it. Molnar decided to name the critter Labocania anomala. The genus name here refers to the geologic unit the bones come from, the Labocana Roja formation. While the species name is a Latinized form of the word anomalous, in reference to how weird the thing is. At some point, the holotype of Labocania made its way back to Mexico, where it was renamed IGM 5307. Okay, that's some real good stuff there, but why do these fragments matter? Well, it has to do with what type of dinosaur it was. Right off the bat, you can probably surmise this is a theropod dinosaur. It's got all the fixins. Since it comes from the Cretaceous of southern North America, it can really only be one of three things. Though to be fair, probably more like two things. An allosauroid, an abelosauroid, or a tyrannosauroid. Ralph Molnar didn't have a lot of fossils to work with, but he especially didn't have a lot to work with when it came to doing a taxonomic analysis. Back in the 1970s, the earliest Cretaceous, giant North American theropod was Acrocanthosaurus, an allosauroid from the early Cretaceous. No other allosauroids were known. Another would be described as Siats in 2013, based on fossils found in 94.6 million year old rocks from Utah. In the 1970s, Molnar had to compare his La Bocania with fossils from Africa, Bahariasaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, and Spinosaurus all of which were extremely fragmentary, anomalous, and shared various traits with Lapacania. Serendipitous that these animals would still be largely mysterious to this day. Suffice it to say, Molnar didn't find that Lapacania shared enough details with allosauroids and other weird theropods to place it in any group. Other paleontologists, such as Andrea Gao, would insert the traits of Lapacania into digital analyses of allosauroids in 2024. Gao found that Labocania placed as a Carcharodontosaurid allosauroid as a sister to Xiaoxilong of China. Interestingly, the specimens upon which Xiaoxilong is based were named Chilontesaurus in the 1970s, and Molnar wrote of the similarities he found between the then Chilontesaurus and Labocania. So there is at least a small amount of precedence there. This is what Labocania might look like if it was a Carcharodontosaurid. The next option is probably the least likely, an abelosauroid. This identification was only briefly brought up by Thomas Holtz in his review of the Tyrannosauroidea published in the 2004 edition of the Dinosauria. He noticed that the shape of the quadrate bone and thickness of the frontal bone were similar to that seen in abelosaurs, the short-armed, thick-skulled ceratosaurs. However, even he posited this as a lesser possibility. After all, abelosaurs are known only from Africa, South America, and Europe. This is something like what Labocania may have looked like if it were an abelosaur. The last option is not necessarily the most likely, but is the one that most researchers have landed on, and it has subsequently become etched into the zeitgeist of paleoart. 
Molnar compared Labacania's pelvic bones to those in Tyrannosaurids, finding quite a lot in common. Its teeth are also similar to those of Tyrannosaurs in being fat, recurved, and D or U-shaped in cross-section. That is, except for the teeth near the front of the mouth, which Molnar noted resembled those seen in Deinonychus. They were flat and recurved with small serrations along the outside edge. Thanks to the nature of Labocania, not many paleontologists seem to have ever put it in a digital phylogenetic analysis. Molnar couldn't, so he just compared and contrasted anatomy between bones. He determined Labocania to be Inserte cetus, or an animal that is unplaceable pending further analysis. Holtz didn't because of how fragmentary the fossils were, and also because he was just writing an overview of the Tyrannosauroidea. And of course, Gao did one, but for an allosaur identification. I found that DeviantArt user Atlantis536 conducted a Tyrannosaur-specific analysis in 2022, using the work of Delcourt and Grillo 2018, Nei Kao 2022, and Voris et al. 2020. They found that Labacania placed as its own thing, sister to the dubious Chinkankausaurus and the New Mexican Bistayeversaur, which is traditionally seen as slightly more advanced. However, Labocania comes from the Labocana Roja formation. This is weird because Molnar, Garbani, and friends had originally thought this unit of rock dated to the late Campanian stage of the late Cretaceous, around 73 million years ago. However, much more recent research into these rocks using zircon dating has found it to really date to the Cenomenian to Turonian stages of the late Cretaceous, 93.6 million years ago. If Labocania is a tyrannosaur and truly places anywhere close to what Atlantis 536 found, then it is a very unusual anomaly in tyrannosaur evolution. It has features of much later tyrannosaurs. Bistahi Eversaur is from 75.5 to 74.5 million years ago, while Chingankosaurus comes from rocks dating to between 85 and 75 million years ago. Could this mean that these seemingly more advanced tyrannosaurs are actually stragglers from a very old lineage that originates from Labocania-like tyrannosaurs? Or is there still a very clear, almost step-by-step -step evolutionary change from group to group? Way too early to tell, I'm afraid. Only more material of Labocania will solve this issue. If Labocania was a tyrannosaur, then this is potentially what it may have looked like. Molnar even pointed out that there were no features in the bones of Labocania that would exclude it from being similar to Gorgosaurus or Albertosaurus. That being said, many recent Tyrannosaur discoveries have shown that the group did diversify into some interesting shapes and sizes. So maybe Labocania was doing something wacky here too. With what little is known of Labocania, there's no way I could give you an idea of how big the sucker was, right? Well, not with that attitude. It's the special visualizing power of someone like Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme that would be the only thing that could do it. Thanks to the 1974 publication of La Bocania, plenty of people have tried their hand at providing a size estimate. Infamous lumper and paleo artist Gregory S. Paul used whatever his odd methods are to come up with a length of 7 meters, 23 feet, and a weight of 1.5 tons. Ruben Molina Perez and Asier Larramendi published their estimates in the 2016 Dinosaur Facts and Figures, The Theropods and Other Dinosaur Formies. They got 8.2 meters, 27 feet, and 2.6 tons. Whoever was writing the Wikipedia article pulled 6 meters, 20 feet out of where the sun doesn't shine, but erring on the side of smaller is probably more accurate anyways. Thanks, Mr. Man. Now that I've gone over everything there is to know about the one and only Labocania specimen known to science, and what little there is to glean from it, the last possible thing to cover is the world in which it lived. Labocania comes from the Labocana Roja formation, which consists of lots of fluvial deposits, mudstones, sandstones, and conglomerates. These rock types are reminiscent of sediments that were laid down by rivers, deltas, and floodplains, but potentially slightly higher up than extremely lowland areas. Larger stones and cobbles would not be as present in lowland sediments. Plenty of fossils have been found of the average ecological backbones. Your plants, shells, mammals, and reptiles, but only a few dinosaurs. The enantiornithine bird, Alexornis, 
and a few specimens of hadrosaurs. Considering the fauna found in rocks right above and below the La Bocana Roja formation and rocks that are of equivalent age, you can be reasonably sure that ankylosaurs, nodosaurs, ornithomimosaurs, early ceratopsids, early therizinosaurs, oviraptorosaurs, and maybe even some rare titanosaurs were present throughout this region. A region that was connected to mainland Mexico at the time. I wonder what new things will be found about Mexican tyrannosaurs. Stay tuned. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.